The Lord of the Rings, translated from the Red Book of Westmarch by John Ronald Rule Tolkien. Herein is set forth the history of the War of the Ring and the Return of the King as seen by the Hobbits. Hey everyone, Yoiston here, and I hope you all are doing well, wherever you are in Middle-earth. Today we will once more be discussing the frame narrative of Tolkien's works in this updated video, as I have learned much since the original version of this video. Now of course there is so much to be said on this topic, and I surely won't say everything there is to tell about it, but my hope with this video is to explore how Tolkien viewed these stories he wrote, even within the stories themselves. Many sources for today's video may be found in the description, so please check those out for more information. My friends, thank you so much for joining me today. Let's begin our tale. This idea of a frame narrative can be rather complex, so let's talk about what a frame narrative is. In the context of a story, sometimes the characters within the tale write down their adventures, and the writing is meant to serve as the tale we are reading itself, the book in our hands, as if to connect us to the world and the characters. Sometimes this may provide us with a more immediate point of view, and sometimes it will read in third person. Furthermore, it's meant to outline that there are certain aspects of the stories that are outside of the scope of our characters, things that they wouldn't know. Now, the best example I can provide of this is The Hobbit, as it is very clear to the reader that the author and narrator of The Hobbit is indeed Bilbo Baggins himself, as Bilbo will make small interjections within the tale he tells as he tells it. Of course, the idea of The Hobbit's frame narrative is further explored in The Lord of the Rings, as Bilbo writes his story primarily while in Rivendell within the book called The Red Book of Westmarch, which we will return to in a bit. In a very simple sense, this is a frame narrative. As Bilbo wrote The Hobbit within the world of Middle-earth, the very Hobbit we come to read. Now, other frame narratives, including some of Tolkien's very own ideas, add much more complication to frame narratives than just this, but ultimately this is the idea. Bilbo wrote his story as he remembered it all those years later, which means his story is also subject to human error. In the original version of The Hobbit, Tolkien, in our real world, wrote that Bilbo didn't so much take the ring as he won it, but then he later revised it to the story we know of how Bilbo found and took the ring by accident. As it is hinted at during the Council of Elrond, Bilbo would actually tell his false tale about winning the ring to some people prior to this, but he would ultimately reveal the later truthful and canonical way of how he acquired the ring during the Council of Elrond. Though Bilbo would not correct his false telling of the story in the Red Book, something later copiers in the world of Middle-earth would amend. And this is yet another example of how masterfully Tolkien used the frame narrative. Rather than entirely retconning his original edition, he said that that's how Bilbo told the story himself, as Bilbo's character flaws saw him frame the story that way before someone else revised it with the truth that it was an accident later. Thus, we have to thank the random, unknown copier of the Red Book for amending and changing it back to how the story actually was. Now that we have a common definition and example of a frame narrative, let's look at some of Tolkien's original ideas concerning the frame narrative before we look more at the Red Book of Westmarch itself and what ended up being more or less the canonical version of the frame narrative. There is a famous Tolkien character named Alfwine Iriol of England, originally named Otar Wifri, who was indeed a human man of England, an Anglo-Saxon born around 869 AD in our real world. Now, without getting too much into the fictional details of his life, this character, Alfwine, would become a sailor, being a descendant of Eärendil of Gondolin himself, son of Tour and Idril. Alfwine of England would actually find the straight road leading to Valinor from our world, and he would encounter the elves of Tol Erisea, the island right off of the coast of Valinor. There, upon the island of Tol Erisea, in a village called Tavrobel, he would meet a loremaster of the Noldor elves named Pengoloth, who shared with him the stories of the Eldar from the Elder Days, including the Ainu Lindele, the Lamas, the Quenta Silmarillion, the Golden Book, the Children of Hurin, and the Annals of Ammon and Beleriand. Much of this frame narrative lore may be found in The Lost Road and other writings. Anyway, Alfwine would eventually return to England, and he would translate many of these stories into Old English, and his descendants would be people who experienced memories, visions, or dreams of their ancestors concerning the fall of Atlantis, or Numenor. Presumably, one of these descendants would be Tolkien himself, who had dreams such as these. Indeed, this was originally the way, or according to what one believes to be canonical or not, that the stories of the Elder Days came to our world, through this character of Elfwine and his descendants, 
and this frame. Now, while I do find this fictional tale to be very fascinating and inspired indeed, it does add much more complexity and even some conflicts in the lore of Tolkien's writing. For instance, one of many potential lore issues that this could have is how could a man of mortal kind come to the Undying Lands in later ages, even Tol Erisea, and return with his life to our world, when someone like Amandil, father of Elendil, did not? Why would the elves share with him these stories? And also, why would he be able to take the straight road back to Middle-earth when it seems to only be a one-way passage? Now, Christopher Tolkien largely took Alfwine out of the Silmarillion to make the work of the Silmarillion less complex than it would have been, but he does speak to it in the notes of the History of Middle-earth saga. What's more, another frame narrative is provided, and one I think to be more canonical as well, and that is the Red Book of Westmarch. Originally a diary of Bilbo Baggins, the Red Book of Westmarch would be the book that Bilbo wrote his story of The Hobbit in, and during his time in Rivendell during the late Third Age, he would add Hobbit poems as well as something called Translations from the Elvish, which were legends from the Elder Days. Presumably, I imagine these translations were the stories that are found within the Silmarillion, Unfinished Tales, etc. Eventually, Frodo would write his own story in the Red Book of Westmarch concerning the downfall of the Lord of the Rings and the return of the King, one of the many lengthy names that Frodo came up with alongside the Hobbit's many titles as well, such as There and Back Again and What Happened After, etc. Again, our characters of Frodo and Bilbo were not perfect narrators, and while they were generally reliable narrators, not ones to lie to us the readers except perhaps for Bilbo's riddle game with Gollum, as I mentioned before, they were also simple authors, struggling to come up with the titles that we know so well. After Frodo and Bilbo left this Middle Earth, the Red Book was left to Samwise Gamgee, who added parts of his own to the narrative, and that passed to his daughter Eleanor, and it, the original copy, the Red Book, would be a family heirloom. However, King Elisar, Aragorn, requested a copy of the Red Book of the Piri Anith, the Hobbits, for Gondor. Merry and Pippin, who added background information on Arnor, Gondor, and Rohan, what I imagine to be tales in the appendices, would bring this copy called the Thane's Book southwards, as Pippin was the Thane of the Shire, and this was his copy of the Red Book. King Elisar and other Gondorians would augment the works and add more to them, and the book received many annotations and even corrections, especially concerning Elvish, for as told in the prologue, note in the Shire records, part of the Lord of the Rings, even Frodo could not perfectly understand Elvish. There would be much information added into the Red Book copy, such as the Tale of Years, which Merry helped put together with information from the lore in the Great Smeals of the Shire, or the Tale of Aragorn and Arwen written by Barahir, the grandson of Faramir and Eowyn, or many pieces of lore besides those. But there would also be a great deal of information not included in the Red Book, left in the Great Smeals of Tuckborough in the Shire. Some things in the book would be unintelligible or forgotten pieces of lore, later on as the ages went by. Now, I must imagine the copy passed down in Minas Tirith, this Thane's book in the world of men, would be, in the frame narrative, the copy a professor named J.R.R. Tolkien would find and would translate for us to read. If you have your copies of The Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, The Silmarillion, or The Lost Tales Part 1 near at hand, open them up to the title page. Thanks to the Tolkien Forum and Hobby Lark and any others who translated these, links to them can be found in the description. In The Hobbit, those old Anglo-Saxon runes that you see read The Hobbit, or There and Back Again, being the record of a year's journey made by Bilbo Baggins of Hobbiton, compiled from his memoirs by J.R.R. Tolkien and published by George Allen and Unwin LTD. On the Lord of the Rings cover page, the Kirth runes at the top read, The Lord of the Rings translated from the Red Book, and the Tengwar on the bottom read, Of Westmarch by John Ronald Rule Tolkien. Herein is set forth the history of the War of the Ring and the Return of the King as seen by the Hobbits. On the Silmarillion title page, the Tengwar reads, Quenta Silmarillion, the history of the Silmarils, the tales of the First Age when Morgoth dwelt in Middle-earth, and the elves made war upon him for the recovery of the Silmarils, to which are appended the downfall of Numenor and the history of the Rings of Power in the Third Age, in which these tales come to their end. Now, if you also have the Book of Lost Tales Part 1, according to Lantarian on the Tolkien Forum, the Tengwar here roughly reads, This is the first part of the Book of Lost Tales of Elfiness, which 
Eriel, the Mariner, learned from the elves of Tol Erisea the Lonely, on the top and on the bottom continues, Isle in the Western Ocean, and afterwards wrote in the Golden Book of Tavrobel. Herein are told the tales of Valinor from the music of the Ainur to the exile of the Noldoli and the hiding of Valinor. Again, it's very complex, but since these are the runes and inscriptions on the published books of Tolkien, I must imagine that this idea of the Red Book and other writings coming by way of Bilbo, Frodo, and many other hobbits to Gondor, and then eventually being found by Tolkien and being translated by him, was how the frame narrative ended up. And we have Tolkien to thank for finding and translating these works from the Elder Days. But of course, in reality, we do have Professor Tolkien to thank for creating such wonderful tales and a frame narrative for them. While this topic and this video are both complex, I hope this has helped in exploring the frame narrative of Tolkien. Thus, when we seem to come across any sort of plot holes or unexplored bits of story in Tolkien's works, we can actually always refer back to the frame narrative and how the characters who wrote this story must not themselves have completely understood these things either, or so forth. For instance, what happened to the Blue Wizards? Our characters didn't know, so it only makes sense that we didn't know. You can have that explanation for so, so many things, and it really adds to the world building of Middle-earth. It adds such an interesting element to the works, and with that, we come to the end of our tale about Tolkien's frame narrative. From this tale, we see that when we create art, we must not only make the content beautiful, but the structure as well, just as Tolkien did here. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you did, please be sure to hit that like button and share this with a friend. Thank you also to the sources in the description. They really, really helped me out with the creation of today's video. Check them out for more information. What are your thoughts, questions, additions, and corrections on the frame narrative of Tolkien's works? Let me know in the comments below. As I mentioned before, I love that Tolkien approached both the content and the structure of his works to be art, not just the content as many people do. The telling of the story is just as impressive as the story itself with Tolkien. Thanks to our Valar tier patrons, Adrian De La Tour, Chris Ortner, Kyle Wetzel, Peter Shepard, Jonathan Putin, M, Mark Kralik, Blair Scouten, Merton, John Hume, Jennifer Wood, Sam McBee, Matt Sabach, Quantum Catalyst, Elizabeth Calvert, Maz Gibbs, Ben Gardner, Condar, Reese Jenkins, Adam Petrilik, Kuzan, and Brandon Glidden. Thank you so much and thanks to all of our patrons. It really means a lot. Please subscribe and hit that bell button to join the Men of the West and all of the free peoples today. And I'll see you all again next Sunday in the new year with a video on the watchful peace and the finding of the ring as we continue the timeline of Arda. Everyone, thank you all so much for another year, for being here to watch and support the channel. I'm so fortunate and blessed to be able to interact with you all and to do what I do. The channel's seventh anniversary is coming up on the 29th, so thank you all again. It really means a lot. My friends, thank you all so much for joining me on this adventure. Until the next one.